Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is March 2nd, 2010, and my guest today is Don Boudreau of George Mason University. Don, welcome back to Econ Talk. Always good to be here. Our topic for today is public choice, the application of economics to political science and the political process. And I want to start us off with a story uh, that you are the cause of. Uh, in a couple of podcasts back with Garrett Jones, I referenced a letter you wrote, uh, a letter to the editor on the death of John Murtha. I want to reprise that uh, my reaction to that and let you chime in. I also want to <clears throat> mention some of the reactions we got from listeners. Uh, John Murtha passed away a couple weeks ago, and he was lauded on the front page of the Washington Post in his obituary as the king of pork, that he had done a very good job bringing goodies back to his home district, his constituents. And you wrote uh, – and I thought a very uh, clever and thoughtful point that if a person went around the country breaking into other people's houses, stealing their money, taking their cars, uh, burgling uh, houses and, and breaking into banks and then came back and distributed the proceeds to one's buddies in, in, your, in one's hometown, you would be considered a thief, not a hero. But somehow when a representative of, of the U.S. House of Representatives does it, it's considered um, – He's a good politician or a successful politician. And I made the remark that uh, agreeing with you, I said, it's a shame that people aren't embarrassed to be that kind of politician rather than taking pride in it. And, and I want to add a couple footnotes to that, that conversation, then I'll let you chime in. So uh, I want to say I, I don't want to be naive. Uh, I may have said in that podcast – that there was once a good, some good old days when people didn't act uh, in such ways that were beneficial for them and not good for the body politic. And that may have – that's naive. I, I think people have always tried to bring home goodies to their constituents. Um, I just think there's less – there used to be less scope for it. And so I don't think it was as uh, prevalent. But sure, people have always tried to get army bases put in their districts and dams built in their districts and all kinds of things that the government can do to, to make a politician look good. Um, second point I want to make is that some people get very upset that I had been so critical of democracy, that, that this is part of the democratic process, that inevitably – uh, there's you know, quid pro quos in politics, and, and to be so critical of it, to call it theft, isn't productive to the enterprise of, <coughs> of, of, of good government. And I have to di I disagree with that. Uh, I think it's really important that we expose uh, government as being unproductive when it is unproductive. And in particular, I think it's important to distinguish between democracy and various forms of democracy that, that uh, happen in practice. So the idea that that the will of the people, whatever that means, and when we'll get into it, should have some impact on political outcomes. That, that's a good idea. It sure beats tyranny. Uh, the idea that majority rule, for example, is a good idea that has some golden um, specialness to it I think is dangerous. And that what makes the United States so successful historically is the fact that we're a constitutional republic. And one of the roles of the Constitution is to stop government from doing things that are closer to theft and less like – things that government ought to be doing. So I just want to clarify, I'm not an anarchist. I'm not a, a romantic about the past roles of government. I think government was a little more effective in the past because it did less. Um, so I'll stop there and I'll let Don, I want to get your comments to that conversation. Well, it's and, and then we'll move on to some other topics. It's certainly true that that is the way modern democracy works. But, you know, David Hume taught us by exposing the, the what he called the naturalistic fallacy, that you, that just because something is doesn't mean it ought to be. Uh, it, it's true. That's the way it works. But that's not the way the world should work. We should not have, in my view, and I'm making a value judgment, of course, but I think it's a value judgment that's widely shared, an institution in which people are able to uh, take resources from 
others, uh, bring them back home for their own benefit and for the benefit of their of their buddies. Uh, that is as as uh, blatant as the institution we have now. Rent, uh, excuse me, pork barrel politics, which is what John Murtha was very very good at, allows him to do exactly what thieves would do in the example that that I gave you. The fact that it's common, the fact that it's typical, does not make it right, and it doesn't, in my view. Uh, in fact, it, it, it makes it incumbent, as, as you suggest, upon us to point out that that's the underlying reality. You know, you go to what Frank Charterov is a great writer in the mid part of the 20th century, and he said, he, he said, you know, you go to Washington and you see these beautiful buildings, these marble columns, and it looks very majestic. And it's true. I, mean, I, I, I live near Washington. And it's a pretty city, and these pretty, wonderful design building, wonderfully designed buildings, much of it neoclassical architecture. Uh, and that glorious facade hides a lot of really nefarious behavior. And the fact that the people who commit that behavior are elected to office, the fact that they have titles, the fact that, that what they do is not legislated as criminal activity, does not mean that it, uh, that it, it is good for society. It does not mean that it differs in any fundamental way from activities done by people who are recognized as criminals, uh, as as bad, undesirable activities that should be prevented. And the only way they're going to be prevented or have any hope for preventing those activities is if people more widely understand what the true nature of those activities are. Yeah, and, and one of the ways to reduce, in my opinion, to reduce those kind of uh, opportunities is sh the people who exploit those opportunities is shame. Yes. Shame is an underappreciated social force um, that I think applies not just to the case we're talking about here but also to Wall Street. And a lot of people um, – this is not an unrelated point. A lot of people say, well, you know, Wall Street made a lot of money in the crisis but they have an incentive to do so and they were just playing by the rules and of course – if you have a chance to make a lot of money, why wouldn't you? And the answer would be, well, if it's wrong, you still might do it anyway. But if it's wrong and it's destructive and you're betraying your fiduciary responsibility or worse, if you're manipulating the rules, which, of course, Wall Street tries to do yes. because government controls the rules, uh, it's not good. And it would be better if Wall Street had a culture that said uh, some of the things that are profitable are immoral and we're not going to pursue them. That would be better than trying to make them illegal or to keep them from happening through legislative or regulatory changes. And similarly, it would be just great if people in Congress felt that they actually meant the oath of office that they swore uh, when they were elected to keep to uphold the Constitution. And when they do things that are not constitutional, even though they're not called unconstitutional, it would be just – it would be a better world if they said, well, I can get away with this, but I won't. Uh, right. It's a huge part of morality that uh, you and I have probably talked about this before. Not everything that's illegal – excuse me, not everything that is legal is right and not everything uh, that is illegal is wrong. And you, you should make to, – to view the, the legislative uh, – those legislative distinctions of legal and illegal as a guide to morality is a, is a horribly dangerous process. Any study of history shows you that. So uh, – I just want to say that I, I, don't, I don't want to be naive again about the role that shame might play down the road. But, of course, voting scoundrels out of office is doesn't require shame. If they don't feel the shame, you can still vote them out of office. And if people felt uh, that these were inappropriate activities for government, they would uh, they would respond accordingly. Now, one of the problems is, is that people in the district in Pennsylvania where Representative Murtha uh, was in office, was representing – they are benefiting. They have the same issue. They're, they're the beneficiaries of his skill. So there's a certain natural incentive to keep him funneling those goodies. Many of them. I'm not, 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 I don't think the majority of them. But yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Uh, some of those funded his campaigns, presumably, the ones who got most of the, of the largesse. Um, and I think we as citizens ought to say no to those things. Uh, we, would, we would be – not literally, no. You know, it's not like you weren't. You, you don't have to be a civilly civilly disobedient and stop the road from being built, but certainly not uh, voting for the candidates who who push those solutions. And it's interesting 
Right now, there's actually some attempt by some candidates to stake out a different moral territory that, that says, you know, I'm not in favor of pork. Now, having said all that, pork's not very big. <laughs> it's a really, you know, the glass is half full, folks. You know, we talk about the problems of democracy. In the United States, at least at the current time, uh, current time's a bad phrase. Right at the current time, pork is very out of control, I think, because I think much of the stimulus package was pork rather than actual stimulus. Uh, it was the paying off of politically important people. But through most of U.S. history, uh, the part that we would call pork, special interest, benefits of the museum in your, built in your district, et cetera, it's not – it's small potatoes. Earmarks, yeah. as we talked about with Garrett Jones, are small potatoes. They're emotionally charged. We get upset about them, but um, – but, but but they pork is it's true, in, measured in money terms, even measured in you know, resource uh, wastage terms. But the benefit, quote unquote, of pork for truth seeking people, for people who want to build a, a better society, is that yeah, it 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 it, it, uh, it magnifies po the pork itself magnifies and brings into relief the larger, deeper problems. People, un most people understand that a multi-million dollar airport paid for with federal funds in John Murtha's rural district in western Pennsylvania that has only, I think, two flights a day and an average of 20 flyers a day, and the flights go on from there to Washington, <laughs> uh, that that is n not a good use of resources. Those resources uh, could have been used in a multitude of ways that are more productive for society at large than building that airport that sports Murtha's name, by the way. Um, and so people understand that. And and then when they when they understand that when, when they see that such resource waste exists and that it's the, it is the direct product of modern democratic, I would say, constitution largely constitutionally unconstrained. Uh, majoritarian government now in the U.S. They then are led to ask, well, what else is going on? Uh, if, if, if that airport's unjustified, and it's true, it's small potatoes, perhaps the larger spending bills are unjustified. Perhaps the larger, uh, more generally revered programs are not as deserving of reverence as we might think if we didn't see uh, this pork. In, in, a, in a way, pork is... Um, it's an unfortunate thing for the folks in power because it 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 helps expose the broader public in a way that they can better understand to the true nature of what's going on in Washington. Well, let's talk about that for a minute because I think there's a straw man that uh, classical liberals have to answer and, and help destroy, which is people say, "Well, you know, these free market types, you know, they have a." Uh, there were some interesting ideas, but you know they're against government. And I think you could read uh, Don and I both blog at co-blog at Cafe Hayek, and a lot, uh, some non-trivial amount of what we write is along the lines we've been talking about. And you might think that uh, on the basis of that, Don and I are anarchists because we think government is a, a dangerous way to that steals money from citizens and um, and abuses power. Of course, government does steal money and abuse power. That's that's our point. But that's not all the government does, and it's certainly, at least in my view, and I'll let you give yours, not uh, a view that says that therefore we should have no government. I actually call myself a philosophical uh, non-stater. I don't use the term anarchy because it means no law, and I certainly believe in law. I think philosophically, it's an interesting philosophical question, how far can you push, how far can the privatization of uh, collective actions be pushed. We know from historical studies that it can be pushed pretty far. We know, for example, now that, that money can be supplied privately in a way that 50 years ago, uh, because there wasn't the research, no one, even Hayek, thought it could not be supplied. Although at the end of his life, he became... At the end, at the end of his life, because of some of this historical research, Hayek changed his mind and, rec and advocated uh, what he called the denationalization of money. So I think it's I think it's an interesting question, how far it can it can be pushed. I certainly would not push the button today and get rid of all government. 
uh, social institutions and expectations couldn't stand such a thing, and we would then descend into into anarchy pretty quickly. Genuine, Chaos. horrible anarchy. Yeah, yeah. L- true lawlessness. Um, but the 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 question always is, and, and this always motivated Jim Buchanan in his work. And Buchanan, of course, is you know the, the single greatest figure, perhaps along with Gordon Tullock, in in public choice. Buchanan always emphasized that he said, "Look, the question is compared to what? Right? The, it's, when we ask about the merits of the market, it's not the merits of the market compared to some ideally performing government or some ideally performing." Uh, 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 dictator. It's the merits of the market compared to government as it is likely to perform, as it, the alternative to the market is likely to perform. And so it, just as it's wrong to hypothesize a, a perfectly working market and assume that the perfectly working market is is what's in the re- in reality, it's wrong to hypothesize and believe that there is a perfectly working government. And Again, because the popular mind so celebrates democracy and has what I'm quite sure is a mistaken notion, a, a far too romantic view of democracy's uh, workability, uh, it's incumbent upon, upon us, again, to, 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 to show that democracy or government in general, democracy in particular, has certain flaws that most people are unaware of, and being made more aware of those flaws is important for good public policy analysis. The works of James Buchanan, most of them are online at the Library of Economics and Liberty, and uh, we'll put links to those up um, uh, on this podcast page. Jim's a pr- uh, really a prodigious scholar who wrote in English. Um, Still going strong at age 90. Yeah, and for the most part, his work is accessible, and he does not shy from philosophical thinking and, and the kind of um, – he's very Smithian in, yes. in, in that sense. Yes, yes. Um, now, are you against democracy? No. To the extent that we have government, obviously it should in some way be tied to the uh, choices and desires of the people governed by that government. And – uh, I'm not. I'm no genius on these matters, but I suspect that you know regular, fair elections are probably the best way, kind of the way we do it now, to to have democracy. Uh, people can debate whether or not you want to have you know more uh, online balloting and direct election and various issues. I think those are interesting debates, and not debates that I'm I'm particularly competent at at engaging in. But of course, I'm not against democracy. If you have to, if, to the extent that government exists. It should be, in some broadly defined sense, democratic, constitutionally restrained, uh, which means not only uh, have have off have certain powers that are explicitly off limits to it, but I like the way the 1787 Constitution does it. It it enumerates and grants the powers to the government with the understanding that the powers not the not only the understanding the stipulation in the Ninth and Tenth Amendment that powers not granted to the government, to the to Uncle Sam, remain with the states or with the people, uh, wherever they were you know, prior to the constitutional constitution ratification. Uh, what I am against is the romantic type. It's a hard word to say. Romanticization. You know. Yeah, of <laughs> of the state and particularly of of uh, the of democracy. Uh, you know, Kenneth Arrow, who's no free market radical by any means. You know, great American economist, one of the first Americans to win the Nobel Prize in economics. Uh, you know, his his uh, signature work is showing that 1951. 1951 is showing that uh, there is n- no system of collective choice, be it majoritarian voting, be it uh, appointing a, a, a dictator. There's no system of collective choice that. It generates outcomes that are not arbitrary, somehow arbitrary, that are not somehow uh, – where the outcomes are not somehow the product not of the genuine preferences and choices of the voters 
uh, and the people governed, but instead are the result of the particular mechanisms whereby the collective choice process is carried out. And that, inevitably, the mechanisms then help determine the outcome rather than the That's a more elegant way of saying what I just said. I, that's exactly right, yeah. I'm holding the book in my hand that, that John's talking about. It, where we're sitting in my office here at George Mason in, in Fairfax, Virginia. The book is Social Choice, the Individual Values. It is not written in English, by the way. Uh, no, it's a very difficult <laughs> it's book It's mainly written in mathematics. What's interesting about the book, and I'm glad we're detouring onto this, is that it really should have been the end of, of – um, Welfare economics, um, but it was yes. not. Mm. And I find it remarkable, welfare economics being the study of choices made collectively, sort of in the absence of politics, hard to really yeah. uh, define it um, carefully. I, I, I think economics has done a great disservice to public policy in that by obsessively pointing to market failure, that is, that a perfect market doesn't exist and therefore there's imperfection leading to the natural implication that I think is widely held that therefore the government should come in and solve the problem oblivious to the question of whether whether there's an incentive for the powers to be, the powers that are to, to solve that problem the way that we quote would like it solved in the textbook is um, is really a pernicious and dangerous idea, the whole idea of efficiency in economics, which has some very important and wonderful aspects to it, opens the door to justifications for government that are, to me, not born out in practice. They're just theoretical. That any, they're no more, as you pointed out earlier, they're no more reliable than a claim that, that markets work perfectly and we just leave everything alone. We don't need laws or anything. Yeah. Um, but I want to challenge what you said earlier. Um, you know, you talked back with some – Nostalgia to 1787, a little before our time, but um, a, more, a preferable argument. Uh, most people don't agree – and I agree with you, of course, but most people don't agree with us. Most people prefer discretion to rules. They want to go on a case-by-case -case basis. They don't want to say uh, uh, this is a violation of this constitutional principle. They, they want to say this speech is bad. Uh, for example, recently the Supreme Court ruled that uh, corporations can fund, say, a documentary in advance of a political election. Uh, in a public poll, of course, you can change the wording, I'm sure, mattered. But in a public poll, a, a, a very large proportion, well, well above 50 percent of Americans disagree with that decision. Now, we can debate the constitutionality of it. We're not going to. Uh, you and I happen to think, I think, that both think it's constitutional, but – but the idea that, that we would want to overturn that decision because it, it, it goes against the will of the people or we'd want to uh, ban certain types of speech uh, because most people don't like it, mm -hmm. whereas there's a constitutional principle that the government should not be in the business of banning speech. Most people have trouble with that whole concept. They would rather say, well, I agree with the principle, of course, freedom of speech, but in this case, yeah. it doesn't apply. And I think when we look at the evolution – of American political life over the last 200 plus years, there's a steady deterioration of the role of the Constitution in constraining political outcomes, probably mostly, I suspect, because most Americans don't think that's a good idea. And so and it's turned out pretty well, you could argue. The last 200 years have been generally glorious in American Absolutely. life Absolutely. Uh, on virtually every dimension. Um, Slavery, the big example. Well, big, big exception, exception, obviously, yeah. but we got rid of it. So you know, the trend is yeah. is is good. Uh, you know, you know we're, there are many except there are many things that were not great about yeah. the seventeen fifties, eighteen eighteen fifties, nineteen fifties. But one could argue that the move away from constitutional constraints has been very beneficial. So, what's your answer to that? Uh. Well, it's it's. A, I, I agree with you. I mean, th you, you and I are both are both uh, big fans of progress, and we both agree that there's been a lot of progress over the past two hundred years. Indeed, even over the past twenty or thirty years. Uh, the the answer is twofold. First of all, the Constitution has worked in many respects. I am not among the group of people who believe that the Constitution is a dead letter. Um, it, there are parts of it that are still widely regarded, and the most 
I think one of the most important parts of that document is the Commerce Clause. Uh, the, Describe. The, the Commerce Clause, it, 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 in effect, gives the power to regulate interstate commerce uh, to Uncle Sam, takes it away from the states, uh, in effect. The framers didn't use the term free trade zone, but that's exactly what they created. They created a free trade zone. It turns out to be a free trade zone spanning a continent, a huge uh, uh, continent of many different uh, peoples and, 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 and landscapes and climates. That free trade that we have from Maine to Hawaii, from Florida to Alaska, uh, allows a huge specialization of labor and, 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 and hence prosperity. Property rights are still largely secure in the United States. Not as secure as I'd like them to be, but they're still largely secure. Uh, how much it has to do, by the way, with the Constitution, I, I'm not sure. But I, I put great, it has great importance to the security of property rights, and U.S. property rights are largely secure. Uh, we have never had in this country a government that is so out of control and tyrannical that you know pe pe people just arbitrarily feared for their lives. I mean, there were, there, there were some horrors, of course, um, slavery, the internment of uh, uh, of Japanese Americans during World War II, and that. And we and we have, as Tyler Cowen might say, would say, we have a a high trust society, uh, and so these social institutions, combined with those parts of the Constitution that still are respected, we still have regular elections, uh, two houses of Congress, and although the two houses are not two branches, yeah. uh, three branches of government, yeah. um, uh, it, it still works to a, a great degree. Uh, so I, I don't think the Constitution is a dead letter. There are parts of it, however, that I, I, I do think are dead letters, uh, mostly, well, not indeed, almost all, uh, Section one, Article 1, Section 8, that, that specifies very limited powers granted to Uncle Sam, and most of what Uncle Sam does now has nothing to do with those granted powers. There's, you, there's no way you, anyone can plausibly read Article 1, Section 8 which spells out the powers that Uncle Sam can exercise and conclude that Uncle Sam should be in the business of uh, building airports in John Murtha's home district, for example, or bridges to nowhere in Alaska. People can engage in ledger domain and, and play with words and, and make the argument. That's what clever lawyers and clever politicians do. Uh, but a fair reading of the Constitution, n knowing the intent uh, the, the mindset of James Madison and the framers makes it clear that they had they did not envision a national government with vast powers. They did not envision a vast government whose powers were, were uh, who, who could only be stopped from acting when you found a prohibition in the Constitution. They envisioned a government that would be stopped from acting only uh, always whenever it got beyond those very limited powers enumerated in in section 1 but they article. lived a long time ago and yeah. who cares about their intent and they were wrong it turns out uh would be the claim that you know all these expansions of government i would i would emphasize social welfare the the, the bad term the social spending um social security medicare medicaid uh, the whole the whole welfare state uh, most Americans generally support the regulatory environment we live in from the FDA to food inspection to the Environmental Protection Agency most Americans support and most Americans agree that that, that those were all good things so even the, if they were unconstitutional the, the fact look the fact that most Americans support these things does not make them wise or good the very idea of a constitution is to um, create a government that is is not uh, tightly tied at every moment to majoritarian passions, and 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 so, so take for example Medicare. Medicare is going bankrupt. I mean, it's it's in terrible financial shape. Most Americans support it today because of a public choice 
uh, 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 concept that we call rational ignorance. Most Americans support it today because they don't really know what the situation is. Uh, Medicare recipients are getting their payments. The fu future generations are being taxed to pay for those, and that bill's coming due. And if you're look, if you know, if if, if most even young people don't look 10, 20, 30 years in the future with any clarity. If you're 70 or 80 and someone tells you, well, Medicare is going to be bankrupt in the year 2035 or whatever the year is, you might express uh, uh, horror, oh, that's terrible, but you don't really care that much. You, you want your check, you want your pharmaceuticals and your doctor visits to be paid for, and right now Medicare is doing that. But the bill's coming. The bill's coming due. Uh, same thing with Social Security. Much of what government does today uh, is, uh, gets approved. First of all, gets enacted and stays enacted, and even gets approval because the collective nature of what government does means that people don't know the full consequences of the, the particular programs that they support. Um, I, I, I like to talk about rational ignorance. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, first of all, the term sounds weird because you, know, you think, well, it's ignorance, oxymoron. rational, and sh surely uh, ignorance, is, ignorance is always irrational. Well, well, all it means is that look, knowledge is a scarce good. It's not free. If it, if it were free, each of us would be geniuses and fully informed about everything in the world. But it's a good not. assumption, but unfortunately, it's not it, consistent with reality. It's not it's not at all consistent with reality. There, there's a huge amount that that we don't know. Um, now, you and I spend much of our life, much more of our lives, in the typical American studying public policy. A few years ago, I went into the library, and uh, I, I went to the government document section and found the. Um, an, the, the annual, this must have been 2003, 2004, um, uh, Code of Federal Regulations, the CFR, as lawyers, lawyers call it. These are all the regulations promulgated by um, the, uh, the federal bureaucracy, that most of which have the force of law, just as if Congress had passed them. I brought a tape measure with me, and I measured the amount of library shelf space that the Code of Federal Regulation takes up. You know, these they're, they're sitting on shelves like books, right? And 26 feet of library shelf space. And by the way, that wasn't all of the regulations because some of the regulations were, were uh, uh, confidential, top secret, involving the Defense Department. I, I have no idea how large they are. Eight yards, a little over eight yards, almost a first down yeah. Uh, yeah. Of, of regulations. Yeah. Now, this is published every year, but, but it, it, each, each annual volume, each annual public uh, set Collection, yeah. contains, contains all of the extant regulations. One's passed back in the 40s, one's passed. That are still in effect. That, that are still in effect. That's right. And uh, so it takes up a huge space. And by the way, it's the prints are on thin paper. Many of them uh, are, are d double columned in, in on the pages. And so I just closed my eyes after I measured, and I randomly grabbed the volume off the shelf because I wanted to test uh, uh, to see if I knew what was in this thing. Right? Grabbed, the, grabbed the volume at random. Turned out it was a volume containing regulations from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. I opened it at random put my finger on a page at random and wanted to see and saw what regulation I found. And I, I put my finger on a regulation that set up, uh, that, that created the Southwest Texas Lettuce Growers Association. Right. Now... Well, that's correcting a market failure because there's... Uh, right. Uh, now, no I, doubt. I mean, I'm sure because that's what government does. It corrects market failure. Yeah. Now, uh, I had no idea... <laughs> That Uncle Sam created a Southwest no, Texas lettuce grower. It sounds like a cartel that. to me. I, I could yeah. be wrong on that. Yeah. But, right? but, but the point is, not so much what is a Southwest Texas Lettuce Growers Association. The point is, government does so much. It's, it's, it's impossible to, to know it all. So the idea that when people go to the polls, they cast informed votes is ludicrous. Most of what government does, people are not informed about. Now, the reason why it's rational to not be informed about it, for two reasons, or one general reason, time is scarce. Gaining knowledge takes time. Most of us, all of us, we have 
uh, 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 you know, we, we need leisure from time to time. We have jobs to do. We have families to take care of. We have relationships to build or to mend. We have lots of responsibilities. We can't spend all that time studying up on public policies, reading all the so various the theories. Informed voters, make, you know, the way right. the romantic view we have of right. of uh, people in togas sitting around debating public policy in, in ancient Greece or Rome. Yeah. Exactly, and so. Uh, it takes a little bit of the sheen off of the romantic notion of democracy to recognize that that at, at the margin, most people do and should spend their time spend their time uh, attending to those things that that affect them most directly. You'd be a poor father if you became a fully informed voter because you spend all your time in the library or before the screen reading the Code of Federal Regulations. Twenty six feet, yeah, and, and your kids would never would never know you. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in the private market, when you decide to buy a car, not to buy a car, to buy a gallon of milk, or not to buy a gallon of milk, the decision's yours. And, and so you have incentive uh, in each of your market transactions to gather as much information f- for yourself that, that you think is, is requisite given the size and importance of, of the financial transaction. But despite what the romantics say, no voter will have a, dis- a discernible outcome on the election. Your vote counts in the sense that it's counted. It's included, right? yeah, but in the it, pile. But it will not affect the outcome of an election. Now, people don't like to hear this because it, it, it really rankles their romantic notion of democracy. Every yeah. vote counts. I've it's- lectured, by the way, to, to journalists on this, and when I say that it's – I vote, by the way. Uh, I don't. It don't, doesn't. I, I vote in most uh, – virtually every national election I've had a chance to vote in, and probably some local. I, I can't – count how many I've missed or gone to, but um, I vote even though I understand that that the actual outcome of my vote is immaterial to the outcome. Um, when I it suggested, I've suggested that to journalists, say, in sessions that I run to communicate economics to journalists, they're, they're, it's greeted with two reactions. First, laughter. Like, well, of course, what do you mean your vote doesn't – is it important? You, you, your vote's – it's irrational to vote on, on an outcome-based yeah. decision. And then anger, um, that, it's, yes. that there's something un-American about pointing this fact out that, that no national election, you will get- even the closest national election in our lifetime, which for most of us was, was – um, 2000. Was, was 2000 or uh, – uh, a little older, 1960. You, were you alive in 1960? Barely. But 1960 I was, yes. was also a very close one. There have been a couple of really close ones in our election where it was decided by dozens or hundreds of votes. If you had stayed home that day, it wouldn't have made any difference. That's right. Not even in Florida in 2000. Even in Florida. But what if everybody felt they don't? Yeah. They're not. We're just asking the question, but, what is rational for you to do as an individual? Should you spend time reading to your kid or should you vote? There's a strong argument for reading to your kid – uh, helping an elderly person with with some ch- set of chores, doing doing a good deed is is in many ways more productive than voting, and certainly more productive in the narrow sense of what is accomplished. Nothing is accomplished by an individual vote. Um, almost nothing. I mean, there's a you can argue well the the percentage difference then between the candidates. I mean, it's not measurable at even the hundredths of a decimal point right, in, right. in most elections. So, but when you point that out, which is unavoidable. And I'm sure we'll get some angry uh, you know, you will for get, having brought this up here. I will here. be criticized it, it, by some of your listeners. It's just a fact. As I said, it doesn't stop me from voting. I like to vote. I enjoy it. I encourage my children to vote. Don's different viewpoint. That's fine. But um, it's a fact. It, it, you, you can't argue with it. You, you can debate whether how salient the fact it is or how it should affect your behavior. The, the, mora- <laughs> the, the, mor- the, mor- the morality of voting, and I'm happy to listen to arguments that there's a you know some, some, some moral duty to vote. Um, however one comes down on that question, the scientific point remains the one you just pointed out. No voter is going to change the outcome of an election. Therefore, in a national – I mean you could argue in a small town. The, there have been it, elections it ha- it that are – It would have to be really, might, really it's happened, it's happened in history, I think, yeah. that a vote has either been decided by one vote or a tie where, where a person – Really, really small numbers. Not, not, not in – I mean even, it's a very even, low, even, even the typical small town in America – it's, um, never ha- today. it's never happened. It's never happened. Certainly not in a national election. Now, and, and, and it follows from that. This is the point I was making about rational. It follows from that that at the margin, the no voter has uh, uh, strong enough incentives to gather as much information 
about the issues and the candidates as that voter would have if that voter truly believed him or herself to be the decisive factor. And so that's what we mean by, by rational ignorance. Uh, you, you don't have to like the fact that I don't vote to agree with that point. I don't see how that point can be disputed. Um, there is a reason, I think, why in, in elections, when you, when you drive in the street, the, the signs say very little. You just see, <laughs> you, see you know, one, one candidate has name. a blue background, uh, name <laughs> written in red with stars. Another candidate's sign has a red background, uh, his or her name written in blue with stripes and backgrounds. So, you know, vote for so-and-so. They, it may, indicate whether, may or may not indicate whether the person's Democratic, Republican, or Independent. Um, and, 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 and so w- w- voting is not at all analogous to choices made in markets. It's a much more, and I mean this in a, in, in a, not in a moral sense, but in a, an analytic sense, it's a much more irresponsible act. There's a response that you get when you act in the market. If you act uh, in a way that's beneficial to yourself in the market, you get that response. I like the car. You like the car you bought. It's a feedback loop. There's a feedback loop. There is is not that individual feedback loop in the voting process. Well, the the most dramatic example, I think I got this example from you, is if you have a a family of uh, three kids and you buy a sports car and that's your only car, you're going to find out it was a bad choice. Most vote, most car buyers, unlike most voters, spend a lot of time, not not hundreds of hours, but they read a little bit. They test drive the car. Uh, they look at advertising. As you say, the advertising for a car, you actually uh, get to see some of the characteristics of the car, uh, not just the name of the car flashed on the screen, right. Ford, uh, say, yeah. or Toyota. By Ford, by Chevy. Yeah, yeah. as if that was the, enough. Although there is brand name, just like in politics, yes. as there is in, yeah. in in there are some parallels. We don't want to overstate the differences, um, but there's feedback loops in in market decisions that are. I mean, you can vote for your candidate. That, to me, the big that's that's undeniable. The rational ignorance is undeniable. What I think is even more fascinating is you get a phenomenon in politics that you would never have – well, you have it somewhat in, in, in maybe in private markets. Maybe you can comment. You, you buy the sports car and then you brag about how great it's performing as a carpool car. You know, you're oblivious. It would be as if you, – and you keep buying it, by the way. It's, it's not just that you make a mistake. You, know, you can buy a cereal you don't like where markets aren't perfect, choices aren't perfect, people aren't rational in, in some super ma- super human sense in, in private decisions. You can make lots of mistakes in, in, your, in your private life, in your market-based decisions. But you usually stop buying the cereal that makes you nauseous. You usually st- – <laughs> you buy the, the, the flavor of ice cream you like. But in politics, you can keep buying the same flavor over and over again – it doesn't achieve its goals. It impoverishes the people you think it's helping, and you can be a proud supporter of that candidate forever, forever. Not just while they're in office. After they're dead, you can keep talking about what a great president or senator that person was, oblivious to any inf- – as you say, you have no incentive to find – to look deeply into whether that was a wise or informed choice or a horrible error. Uh, it's part of your identity, your That's reputation, right. your self-esteem. It's a very different process. Yes. I, 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 I'm going to say two, two things. One, one criticism that persons such as myself who don't vote get is, oh, well, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're not a, 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 a good civic participant. You're somehow falling down on the job. I don't think I fall down on the job at all. I spend a lot of time, most of it for free, by the way. Yeah. You know, I don't get paid for blogging, um, contributing my thoughts. Now, the thoughts may be worthless, but I'm certainly actively engaged. Uh, in policy. Yeah. yeah, in policy. And so I don't see how – I mean, would I be more productive, for example, if I took the hour and a half that it would take me to vote, let's say, uh, and cast a vote, or spent that hour and a half uh, thinking deeply and seriously about some public policy issue and, and writing an op-ed about it or uh, a blog post about it? Uh, I think the, the – the, in fact, I'm sure the latter – not so much because I think my blog posts and, or op-eds are, are any great shakes, but they may have some effect, uh, hopefully not negative. Um, well, there actually is more feedback loop there, in the there, blog. There's a feedback loop. Because but if you say something stupid and uninformed, at least you have a chance of being challenged. Yeah. Whereas if you vote like a moron, there's no cost. Right. And, <laughs> there's no 
costs. I, I, <laughs> That's I don't right. mean to, to hammer on this because I'm sort of doing this preemptively because I know we're going to get some angry, angry emails. If you vote like a moron, there's no cost. Now, there's a, might be a personal feeling of guilt, but your incentive to find out whether you voted like a moron is my, is my second point. It's but not very large. You don't even know. <laughs> it's right. You don't even know if you're a, you don't even know if you're a moron because <laughs> m- most of us learn that we're morons when we when we act in a certain way and consequences from those actions befall us. N- negative consequences tell us it was a moron. If you vote in a moronic way, um, it's too difficult to trace all the complex con- effects of, of your vote. Uh, Onto you, and so if 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 enough people vote moronically, we'll get moronic candidates. But the if the negative effects of those moronic votes do not impact personally those people. And let's be clear about what this means. It is true, of course, that if a bad candidate is elected, right, and and that can that bad candidate puts in place bad policies, those bad policies may will later hurt not only the people who voted for the candidate, but people who voted against the candidate. Yeah. The point is, at the time of voting, that, that act, and it's, it's the individual act of voting that we're talking about, and it's those individual acts that get added up and decide who goes to office and who does not go to office. At, at the, in the act of voting, there is no consequence to anyone from voting A, B, or not voting at all. It, it, and, and, and therefore, people are quite unconstrained in being able to express whatever fantasies, romantic notions, uh, anger that they feel uh, without, well, me, any, okay, without so any feedback loop. And, and, and I must say, can I say one more thing about Yeah, sure. An, another, uh, I think, underappreciated um, aspect of voting for candidates in political elections, it's, it's appreciated by public choice scholars, but, but un, underappreciated by the public, is... Uh, and it's underappreciated because you know, we, we talk about, you know, it's the voter's choice. People choose. And by calling... So, hey, that's great. That's right. And I like choice. Um, and, and so by, by attaching the term choose or choosing, choice, to candidates and the process of electing candidates, we give that, we transfer to that choice process the same good feelings we have about, say, choosing in a supermarket. And... There's too much difference between those choices to, for the political choice to have that good name. If you go, here's an example I often give. I, I, if you go into a supermarket, if I see you go into to a Safeway, and I see you put into your basket, your shopping cart, uh, a bottle of wine, uh, uh, a turkey, uh, and some paper towels, and I don't see you put in um, diapers, uh, cleaning fluid, uh, bubble gum, and I see you check out. I can be pretty darn sure that, it, for, at least for that shopping trip, you wanted the wine, you wanted the turkey, you wanted the paper towels, and you didn't want anything else that you, you know, certainly could have afforded but chose not to put in your, in your shopping cart. That's not how we choose uh, the uh, uh, policies that get developed. We, we, we vote for candidates. Each candidate is a bundle of policies. A whole can, cart. It's a whole cart. We, we can assume that they, they are honest about what's in their bundle. But so it's like walking into a supermarket and you see before you two or three uh, pre-filled grocery carts, you know, maybe surrounded with plexiglass. And you get to look inside and, and you see cart A and cart A has the bottle of wine. It has the, the turkey. It doesn't have the paper towels uh, that you do want, but then it doesn't, it also has diapers, and you don't have children in diapers. And then so you you look at cart B, and it doesn't have the diapers, and that's good. Uh, it does have the paper towels, that's good. It has the turkey, that's good, but it doesn't have the wine. Oh, you look at cart C, uh, and it's got, some, it's got some other things, some of which you do want, and some of which you don't want. Right? And then you choose among the two, among the three carts. Let's say you choose cart A. Of course, it's behind, as you say, it's behind plexiglass. It could be that the wine... Might have been able to see it's a the whole other exactly. issue. Yeah, yeah it may, <laughs> the paper towel thing might not really be a full roll. It looks full, but it turns out once you get home, it's only half a roll. It, it may be vinegar in a wine yeah, bottle, but, yeah. but that, let's put that issue aside, right? What we can conclude is that you prefer all that we can conclude is that you prefer basket A, cart A, to cart B and C. But we cannot conclude uh, anything about the individual components in that in that cart. You may have chosen. A basket. Well, in fact, given the way we set up the example, you chose basket A despite the fact that it has diapers in it, not because of the fact that it has diapers in it. You chose against basket B despite the fact that it did not have paper towels rather than because it did not have paper towels. And so, therefore, because of this bundling problem, 
you know, and, and obviously the, the, there's an obvious analogy with, with candidates. Each candidate is a, has a position on taxes, the environment, um, uh, in, you know, workers' rights, judicial appointments, abortion, you name the issue. And it, it, it's, it's if, if a majority of voters vote for candidate Smith and against candidate Jones – uh, even putting Kenneth Arrow aside, or putting Kenneth Arrow aside, we might be able to say, okay, well, the majority of people truly prefer candidate Smith over candidate Jones. No one really knows if the majority prefers candidate Smith because of his position on, say, taxes, or in spite of his position on taxes. But candidate Smith, of course, quite understandably, will he believes that every position that he took uh, is one that in, is in beloved campaign, by the voters in the campaign. In the campaign, right? Right. Well. It's worse than that, of course, because the cart's really big. It's huge. And not only is there you can because see, the rationale you can't you can't even see you everything. You can't see a lot of the things in the cart because right. there's issues that are going to come up later. And as a result, you're stuck with some of that stuff that you didn't realize was in the cart. Right. Even if you liked everything you saw on the top layer, stuff underneath. And of course, and I'm going to. By the way, I want to come to challenge this. this pessimistic view in a second, but I want to first enhance it, so I am sympathetic to okay. it. Uh, making it worse, of course, is that there's a lot of stuff under the toward the bottom of the cart that people behind the scenes have worked to get in the cart that you don't know about. The diaper manufacturers, you get you didn't see the diapers. You found out they were in the bottom of the cart when you got the cart home. Right. Uh, and the reason that, it's like, well, what are the diapers doing in there? And the answer is, well, because the diaper manufacturers Ask the guy, the grocery, to put it in the cart. Uh, that's the lettuce growers out there. Yeah. What we call rent seeking, uh, and the bootlegger and Baptist problem we've talked about here many times. Um, inevitably, what gets in the cart, and which brand of diapers? Um, you know, we might like the idea that the federal government, uh, in principle, we might like the idea that the federal government decide what's the that there's a best way to teach kids how to read. But when the government decides who's going to read and what kind of stuff they're going to use to read at the federal level, there's going to be a lot of people pushing really hard. And it just, just turned out that the people who got the uh, curriculum stuff for reading and the No Child Left Behind legislation just happened to be really good friends of the Bush administration and former administration officials. It's possible that was the best reading material for curriculum, but I suspect not. Yeah. And, and and that is the other problem. You, you know, you, what you get home in the cart with is not what – well, let's sit around and decide what would be the best thing to put in the cart. It's not necessarily that stuff. That's right. That's right. And, and, and a lot of I – mean, to keep the analogy going, a lot of it is truly mislabeled. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, right. Uh, you know – it's called a, it's called safety legislation to protect us from terrorists. When in fact, it's the guy who makes the scanner is getting rich off it, and it doesn't really affect our our safety at all. Right, uh, minimum wage legislation. People, you know, the, the the name of it makes people think, okay, everybody is guaranteed a, a minimum wage. Well, you only guarantee that minimum wage if you work. <laughs> it, it, you're not guaranteed the wage if you don't work. Uh, and so there's a lot of mislabeling. There's a lot of of uh, uh, changing afterward. You know, George. Bush the first, of course, famously said in the 1988 campaign, "Read my lips, no new taxes." And uh, a few years later, he he raised taxes. You had a tax cut in your cart. You didn't realize you got it when you got it. Home. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so let me let me let me give you a. Let's talk about the other view of this. So I'm going to criticize the, your analogy and then get you to let you defend it. This is just a cheap shot at democracy. It's the way democracy has to be. It's a fact of life. People, any candidate, of course, has a whole wide array of views, and they're, and of course, some candidates either change their mind or learn things when they become come in office. Uh, it's an inevitable reality that the democratic process is imperfect, just like the market. Sure, the market makes mistakes, mm -hmm. but so does so does democracy. And yeah, so sometimes you're stuck with with stuff in your heart you don't like. What's wrong with that? That that's that's that that's what democracy is. Is that I get some stuff I like, you get some stuff you like, and you're just – this is a cheap shot. It's a straw man. you got to have this this bundling if we're going to have political outcomes. It, 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 you, you can't have a candidate – I get to vote for a candidate on national defense and a candidate on blah, 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 and a candidate on this, a candidate on that. That's just part of – that's that. That's like asking – it's like complaining about uh, gravity because it, it, it makes us uh, – cars go – burn too much fuel. It, it's just – that's a fact of life. True. I, I – 
I agree. That that is. I mean, these flaws are inherent in collective decision making, uh, in general, inherent in democracy, also in particular. Um, and and the answer is it's, uh, two two responses. First, that's what I said earlier. I, I think too many people are not as aware of these flaws as they should be. There is this romantic view of democracy. Consider the reactions that you get from journalists, who, you know, who skeptical, cynical, yeah, hard baked about, about yeah. uh, you know just refusing to come to grips with the fact that no vote is going to swing the outcome of an election. Um, and so, pointing that out is number, m- number one. Just it's 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 true. It's it and it's good to know truth. And this, a second good reason for pointing it out relates to my second larger justification for m- making uh, uh, public choice arguments, and that is uh, the choice we face uh, is. I like to think of it as always as you know I- increasing the size and scope of government a little bit more or decreasing it a little th- those th- the size and scope a little which bit more which direction should we be heading which direction should we be heading and if people have an excessively romantic view of how government operates because it's democratically elected then there'll be an unfortunate bias in favor of expanding the role of the state and so yes given whatever role of the state we choose uh, whatever role that will be there will be these problems but the very fact that we now recognize that there are these problems means that we might be more skeptical about turning yet more of our resources and 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 more res- over to the government and more responsibility over to the government. We recognize, oh well, it's not; it, it may not work as well as as we think, because there are alternatives in for the vast majority of things to government. We don't need the government to determine the size of our toilet tanks. Yeah. Now that's a collective decision. We don't need the government to decide uh, whether or not we can purchase goods or services imported from foreigners. That's a per- that decision is perfectly able to be handled privately, but we turn it over to, to the state. Uh, and the list, of course, could go on and on and on. Uh, but so the, 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 if you and I were to come up with you know, that list of core responsibilities that you and I feel comfortable giving to government uh, because private alternatives would work uh, more poorly than the government would. I would still say, well, but it's not going to be perfect. All these, all these problems still, st- still exist, but their magnitude and their, their ill effects won't be as large because they'll be confined to a smaller space. Yeah, let, me, let me bring up a, a, another metaphor that sort of brings these points together, which I also learned from you. I think I heard this about 10 years ago in a a talk you gave, that was a phenomenal example. And it really helps you see how, uh, to me, how government works in reality, not in fantasy, and why we ought to limit that role in those in certain areas. And that would be, what if we chose our car, our cars the way we chose our politicians? So this is a variant on the... Um, Sports car. On the bundle, on the... Uh, uh, on the um, Grocery card example, but I think it brings out some important points that I think we kind of we may have missed. So, if we're all we're all going to drive the same car, now we all understand that's not a good idea. Uh, why is it a bad idea? Why wouldn't we want to decide? Well, what's the will of the people for for cars? And and so we we could have candidates propose cars, and let's get rid of the problem of politicians who break their promises, mm-hmm. and let's suppose they really are going to give us the car. That they actually propose. So, candidate A proposes a minivan, and candidate B proposes a family sedan. And let's have family candidate C. They usually aren't right. <laughs> three that are yeah. viable. But let's suppose the candidate C is actually is the sports car. So we've got the <clears throat> minivan, the family sedan, and the sports car. You're not allowed to drive the cars as the voters. You're going to vote for a candidate, and that's the car you get. Uh, you can look at, sort of look at the car mm-hmm. from the outside. You don't get to try it. Listen to it honk its horn. You might, <laughs> it's a lot of horn honking, yeah. Mm-hmm. You hear the radio player. Uh, and, you know, we'd make a pretty good decision. Excuse me. We'd make a pre- we could make a pretty good vote. Now, it turns out, uh, so I have four kids. I might vote for the, for the minivan. Um, 
somebody who's single might vote for the sports car or the family stand. Certainly wouldn't vote for the minivan. And it could be the minivan. I understand it's not going to be the best minivan, but I, I, I'll get a minivan if that's the, if, if my candidate wins. Um, now, when we start adding to that rent-seeking, mm-hmm. the idea that manufacturers would be competing – in ways that would be very difficult for me to find out as to what the features of the minivan would be. You know, that it would have, uh, say, things that I perhaps don't want. I don't want my kids to watch TV in my car. So they might, but they might, the TV manufacturers might lobby the candidate to make sure that's in there. So I'd, I'd get not, not only would I, it, at best I'd get a minivan. It wouldn't be the ideal minivan I'd want, but at least I'd get a minivan. Of course, I might not win. Mm-hmm. My my candidate might not win the election, and I'd be stuck with the sedan or the, or or the sport worse the sports car. Now, in what sense would that be an ideal outcome? We all understand that would be a horrible outcome. It would be much better to let people pick and choose. Why? And the answer is is because that decision, this making that decision collectively, is not a proper role for government because it's it costs me an immense amount. When there'd be an alternative that I could have very – there's no reason I couldn't choose the, right. my own car. Right. And yet we do that. We do that with education. Yep. We do it with so many aspects of our lives through government. And it's true that, well, you know, if we're doing it that way, well, there's some things that are pretty good about it and so obviously there's some things that are wrong. The central question is, is what you said. What is the proper role for government? Is right. this a decision – that should be made collectively, or is the non-collective decision a, a better outcome? Right. And exactly so right. many things – I mean, my rule, by the way, and we haven't talked about this, and I think we ought to close on this. You know, my rule is government should should do for us what we cannot do well for ourselves. Mm-hmm. That's That doesn't tell you exactly what government should do. We can debate about what those areas are. Uh, but picking out a car isn't one of them. Right. And cash for clunkers isn't one of them. Right. <laughs> uh, and the size of the uh, of the um, toilet tanks. Toilet tanks. You, you can make an argument for it, by the way, that it should yeah. be collectively yeah. done. But I don't think it's a very good argument. You can make an argument for all those things. Yes, right? you can. Right. But 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 again. So so the 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 important issue is when those arguments are made, and those are arguments that are at the core of political and public policy debates. What should government do, and what should it not do? Those arguments will be better informed and result in wiser, at least understanding, better understanding, uh, the, the more um, deeply and realistically people understand the way politics really works, the way government really works, rather than understand it in some romantic, rose-colored way. And it's that romantic, rose-colored way that remains the dominant lens through which democratic politics today is viewed. You think that's true? Well, really, I, I, I mean, can you, do you, here, here, here's what's strange about that. Most people have a very low opinion of Congress. They have a very low opish, uh, opinion of yeah. politicians. They see many politicians as lying scoundrels. How do you reconcile that view with this claim that people have a romantic view of government? I, 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 it's rec- I think I, – I don't – I myself could, could <laughs> you, never – You don't have that problem. No, no but I, I think it's – people blame the individual. Let's vote the scoundrels out. Right? Uh, I, better, I, we need a better set – we need a better class of scoundrels. Right. <laughs> well, yeah. I, 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 I do think that politics certainly selects for a certain type of person, um, as most occupations select for certain types of, of personality traits. Um, but – the the problem isn't with the nature the problem the chief problem the f- ultimate underlying problem isn't with the nature of the particular scoundrels who are in office or particular s- people who are in office it's with the incentives that voters face to put them in office and the incentives that these people face once they are in office be it an elected office or be it an appointed office in an administrative agency and it's those incentives that skew the outcome so when, when, when people are asked about particular actions of government, well, I don't like what government's doing now or it's either doing too much or it's doing too little, it's not doing what I want, um, they've, they, I think they focus on the personalities. But the idea of you know the regal capital as the people's house and the president with his veto power and going to the polls, it's still celebrated uh, as uh, uh, an almost uh, 
uh, you know, mystical collective experience where, whereby the will of the people it's a, sac- it's a sacred act it's a, in, it, yeah. in many people's lives. Yeah, and uh, uh, I don't think it's sacred at all. It's, I mean, to the extent that uh, that voting is necessary, it's something that people do, and we will hope they do it well. It's nothing more sacred about voting for a congressman or a president than there is about buying uh, paper towels at Safeway. That's going to get you some angry remarks too. Yeah, I was going to say I I don't know if I want I was we're almost we're, we're we should stop soon, but I I don't want to stop quite there as your closing okay. <laughs> as your closing comment. Do you, do you want to say anything about uh, how we might get there from here? You know, given that we have this romantic vision, uh, many of us we don't, but many people do. Given that something we haven't talked about that that I think about constantly lately is. This idea that if something isn't as good as it ought to be, we ought to spend more money on it, which is something we never do in the private sector, right? right? It just doesn't follow. Nobody says if we want better cars, let's go, let's go write some, let's make some donations to to, to Honda and 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 uh, and to Ford. Unfortunately, we're doing that right now. Yeah. I, it was a bad example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, yeah. but but I, but I think it's interesting that most Americans understand that's not work a good idea. Most Americans opposed the bailout of GM Correct. and Chrysler and said, this isn't the road to better cars. Everybody understands that that set of incentives is, is, is misaligned. But and they is a don't ba- understand that, that's, that those set of incentives are the same ones that are in play in the government school system. Yeah. Uh, and so when people, people can, with a straight, ar- straight faces, make arguments, well, we need to give more money to our government schools, our public schools. And too many people say, well, yeah, that makes sense. That makes yeah. sense. And when, in fact, what we ought to do is spend the money more wisely. In fact, Civilization advances by spending fewer resources to achieve our ends, not right. more. Right. Uh, and we have the same problem, obviously, in in healthcare. And I, I can't resist it just because it's on my mind this week. You know, people who are complaining about this policy or that policy that might involve health uh, price controls on healthcare. Uh, we have price controls on healthcare, folks. <laughs> They're everywhere. The government controls the price of virtually every single aspect of the healthcare process and and decides it by some labyrinthine uh, top down approach, which again is not designed scientifically. It's designed to respond to all kinds of complicated things that none of us who are outside the industry can possibly understand. So, where do how do we get to a different outcome? Uh, given that you don't vote. Uh, in particular, shame on you, Don Boudreau, for not doing your share in fighting the, these these um, these phenomena that you're against. How, how do we get to where we're, where uh, you got thirty seconds? <laughs> well, <laughs> how, do we, how do we get closer to a world where, where government does less and, and not we more? work to build through the promulgation of ideas and also by example? We work to build a culture of freedom and and individual liberty, respect for private property. That's not guaranteed to work. There's no button to push. Uh, but I am very pes- – I, I, I think that if that culture is built, uh, then it will be reflected in the political uh, process. I do not believe the political process can lead it. Uh, if, if, if people want to be led by the nose or are content to be led by the nose, then government will lead them by the nose uh, only by changing the culture. So I do think I do my share. I try to do my share by by writing my letters to the editor and blogging, writing books, uh, teaching, uh, helping students better understand economics. Uh, but there's no there are no guarantees. Just just because we can identify there and we know where we're here, it may be that we can't get there from here. <laughs> so my well, best shot at a New England accent. Not bad. My guest today has been Don Boudreau. Don, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Always a pleasure. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.